Okay. So our speaker today is Dr. Rebecca Peterson, and we are going to have a wonderful workshop today titled Dreaming the Dead and Embodied Imagination. I will let Rebecca tell more about the way the workshop will work today after a short introduction. Rebecca holds a doctorate from Pacifica Graduate Institute in Jungian and Archetypal Studies and is a registered embodied imagination practitioner. Her doctoral research investigated dreamers' relationships with nature. She lived in Mexico for 25 years where she taught art classes and worked in her studio-based expressive therapies practice. Her soul was transformed by living in that beloved Mexico land and culture. She currently lives in her hometown on Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is in the US, where she continues her expressive arts and dream work practice and writing. She offers individual dream work and group workshops, and you can find her and follow her on Facebook. And without further ado, over to you, Rebecca. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you, Evie. I want to just really honor Evie, our wonderful president of the JSSS. And thank you, Jessica, for helping to do the technical work. Um, my pronouns are she and her. Welcome to Dreaming the Dead. I want to take a moment to acknowledge our shared space. Um, this look at each other on the screen. Those who have their cameras on, you can turn them off later. Just saying hello to everybody. Um, it's been my experience that in these new days of online talks that we can really create a real resonance in the virtual world. Jenna, hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So everybody want to invite you to take a nice inhalation. And this is acknowledging the breath that we all share, no matter where we are on the planet. This biosphere is alive. And I see a lot of you have written in the chat where, where you're from. I want to acknowledge that I'm, a, I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I didn't write it in, I forgot. I'm on Puebloan land, Tewa land. And if anybody wants to put in the chat, if you know what indigenous people land you're on, I welcome you to do that or just take a moment to acknowledge that. We're, share, we're also on shared earth as well as shared air. I see all your beautiful faces and I acknowledge your beautiful places. I'm going to jump to the second screen just to see. Hello, Atina, Ryan. Hello. I got to turn my timer on there. So as we go through the PowerPoint presentation, which will come after the introductions, I invite you to have at hand a notebook or a piece of paper or something to doodle with, pencils, colored pencils. You don't have to get too fancy, a pen. And just jot down as we go through the um, PowerPoint, anything that comes up, a memory, a little drawing, it it's helps connect you with, it's a form of embodied writing. And let the images speak to you as I go through the PowerPoint. Chumashlan, wonderful. Okaini Sapone, oh, I love seeing this. Julie, yes, Pueblo in land, Skashwin. Sorry for my mispronunciation. So you might notice any embodied responses as I go through the PowerPoint presentation. And um, the images are kind of designed to take us down into this um, nonverbal state. So we'll be working with the verbal state and the nonverbal state at the same time. If you feel a little frisson, you know, like a goosebump during the PowerPoint, just make a note of what that is. You don't have to even write it down. Just become aware of what your body is doing. 
we're going to allow our daily thoughts to step aside for the moment and enter into a kind of dreamlike space. If the, and a note about this work, if you don't have good dream recall, don't worry. Any memories that emerge during this time, you might remember a dream that you've had, um, but you also, just a memory that comes up might be significant as we are inviting this time of year into the space. Samhain, Day of the Dead, Dia de Muertos. So just a little guideline. I'm going to start with a brief guided embodiment process. You can turn your camera off during this section of the embodied work. Um, feel always free to take care of yourself. If something isn't resonating with you, feel free to um, even leave if you need to, if it gets triggering, but also feel free to stay and work through that. Once, the, um, once I start the PowerPoint, we're going to mute the chat. Chumash lands, Tongva, Tongva, Otomi, welcome these lands. So um, we're gonna mute the chat during the um, PowerPoint presentation. Keep any questions that you have, you may maybe note them in your in your notebook. We're gonna do about two or three questions still recorded that will be from the chat. So if you don't wanna have your live recording, um, I thought it would be nice to just address a couple of questions um, before the recording stops. And then we'll stop the recording and then we'll open it up to Q&A that's live. I also wanna note, as you may have just noticed, yesterday I started getting a cough and a sore throat with not COVID, I tested, but my voice is like, uh, uh, uh. so I may pause to, I have some hot tea here and my little honey cough drop. So excuse me if I start coughing or suddenly um, can't talk, hopefully my voice will last. So with that, let's just all take a moment to begin with a breath. and connect with the earth, feel your feet connected to the ground below you. Feel your toes. Work your way up, noting the skin, the muscle, the blood flowing through, the bone. Just notice what's there. Don't try to change anything. Notice your organs as you work your way up. Notice your knees, hips, your sits bones. Notice your digestion, your lungs. Go up into your shoulders and down your arms, through to your fingertips. Back up your arms into your neck, throat, and notice all the organs of your face, your sensory organs, eyes, ears. Notice your hair and notice into the top of your head and feel the connection to the sky and feel how your body connects above to the sky and below to the earth. So now we're gonna mute the chat and I'm gonna begin sharing my PowerPoint. I want to apologize that I didn't put in the image descriptions in the PowerPoint. Remember to do that next time. Dreaming the dead. I have a little floating thing. I'm trying to turn it off. All right, floating meeting controls there. 
What does it mean to dream the dead? This is an inquiry with no clear answers or solutions, maybe revealing more questions. I want to thank Pacifica Graduate Institute for that PhD. And I also want to thank my teachers, Robbie Bosnack and Jill Fisher, for my embodied imagination practice. Oops, wrong way. My dissertation is titled Engaging the Soul of the World Through Dream. It's available on public access of ProQuest, and I'll share the link at the end of the PowerPoint will be on, on, on there with the um, link to get in. I just invite you to notice these images. Most of them were taken on my recent trip to Mexico. Both nature and dreams can educate us if we have an open and proper attitude toward images as living teachers. The images are alive. The dream figures that we encounter are alive. They have their own agency. Sometimes a dream might be blurry, like how my photo came out blurry, when you can't quite catch the dream, but you have a sense of what it was. This trip that I took to Mexico and this presentation are connected with the death of my mother. She died one year ago in September. In Spanish, we say, soñé contigo anoche. We say, I dreamed with you last night. We don't say, I dreamed about you. And I love that way the language enables us to really be with the figures that we're dreaming with. So these dreams happened three months after her death, around two, three to four months after she died. In the first dream, we we're in Mexico City in a modern high rise. Two brothers who seem to be Eastern European, they're in suits, bring her a gift. They laugh and laugh, they're very funny. They're jokesters. In the second dream, Mom and I are visiting a Mercado de Artesanía, an art, artisan's market that's going out of business. We sit around a long table, like a, like a coffee table with friends, and marvel at the miniature craft pieces. Each is carefully placed within a box, and each box has little compartments. And we admire the pieces, and they light up with happiness. I want to make a note here about journaling your dreams, remembering your dreams. You know, when I went to find these dreams in my dream journal, I could not find them. Don't know where I wrote them. And as I went in this, oh no, I can't find them. They all came back to me. That's how powerful these dreams were. When I write the dreams, I always like to write it in present tense as if it were happening right now. In the dream work, when we go into the dream in an embodied state, a hyp hypnagogic state, we learn to engage with the pieces, the, well, in this case, the pieces of the art pieces with the dream figures, and they begin to resonate and can in a way speak back to us. I had help with this dream with my cohort from 
the embodied imagination group that we that I studied with, we still meet regularly and share each other's dreams. And I was able to literally feel in my body how the little art pieces resonated and how happy they were to be admired. Slowness is one result of the state. In the hypnagogic state, everything slows down because we're in the body. So we're not so much in the mind or into a fantasy. And that process can sometimes be frustrating because it's so slow. But it also becomes a kind of relief from the daily rush of always wanting to get things done and figure things out. It was very amazing to me as I was on this trip, how many of the images of the dream were speaking to me from the world. These quotes are from my dissertation. Through respectful attention, we can create a body of knowledge around our dreaming life, one that guides us through our direct participation with it. So as I'm walking around these beautiful museums in Mexico City and in other parts of Mexico, I feel like I have the dream. It's like a doubleness. The dream is with me and the, the dream figures are with me and the objects in the world are also with me. They themselves begin to be animated. Dreams are often animal presences. Here's the last dream. Mom and I are in Mexico, we're in the campo. We're sitting outdoors on folding chairs in the shade under some wisache trees. We're waiting for a party we've been invited to. Women are cooking in an outdoor kitchen. We can hear them laughing. We are honored guests. It's pleasantly warm. Then someone, maybe the brothers from before, bring, bring mom a gift, a white baby goat. They put it in her arms. It's small and very cute. She laughs and laughs. This is my visit to Mexico one year later. It's the exact anniversary day of my mom's death. Saying yes to life, saying yes to a serendipitous invitation to Doña Jera's birthday party was part of this journey, saying yes to life. I first met this family in 2011 when I was living in Mexico. Her son used to, she used to have her son call me on WhatsApp a couple of, several times a year. Say, now, Rebecca, when are you coming to visit? When are you coming to visit? Don't forget about us. It was a little bit of a surprise that I showed up the day before her birthday. The other family knew that I was going. It seemed like a synchronicity to me. I first met them in a ceremony at this sacred mountain that you see in the distance. This is taken from her front yard. That's a whole other story, my sacred relationship with this mountain and the family. That whole story is like another dream. It was a sacred alignment of planets, of Venus with the moon. And I invite you to ask also, what kind of calling do you have in your life? What kind of calling is this to say yes to these invitations to another world, to another language, 
a soul place to magic, to call in the north. This is a Toltec power site. How it is? How is it that I am here? It's about saying yes. There was lots of food at this party for Dona Hera. I, it was so like my dream. It was really interesting. So much welcoming hospitality, such humble place that they live. A lot of people have asked me since I just returned from this three week trip to Mexico where I lived for 25 years, if I think about moving back. And the conclusion I came to while I was on this trip was that my soul dwells in several places at once. That my soul dwells here in Santa Fe, dwells in Mexico, in all these different places that I visited. And that also my soul dwells in layers of time. So it can be in the past when my mom was still alive. It can be in the dream and in, in the waking. I think this is one of the effects of embodied imagination work. Taking a sip of my tea or my throat. And every time I sip tea or water, by the way, I'll think it. Thank the water, thank the tea. So this, one of the conclusions to allow the dream to live independently of my waking life. So when I dream of my mother, it's not my mother. It's not my literal mother. And yet there's an inevitable bond between the day world and the nighttime psyche. So to experience these simultaneously, the memories of my mother, the dream mother that's receiving this goat, this baby goat, that's the goal of the work. It's living in a kind of dual consciousness. At the time, which was just so shortly after my mother's death, it was such a comfort to receive these dream images. I did feel like I received them. And they've stayed with me over this year, as I've said, since her death, when I couldn't find them in my dream journal, they all just came flooding back to me. I also don't want to restrict the dreams by putting only my own meaning and my own wants onto the dream. How much can I ask of the dreams and what can I give in return? So we're turning to this idea of reciprocity. Reciprocity is a healing factor in dream work. So I come to the dream not only asking something from the dream, but asking what can I give back to the dreaming psyche? What happens in the work is an ethic of caring of caring for all beings. When I dream of the baby goat being held in the arms of my mother, I care for that being, a non-human. And I learn to care for the waking beings that I see around me. Good, my dog's here sitting, sleeping on my couch. <laughs> This ethic of caring is imperative in changing how we understand and act in the world, how we act in nature. Reciprocity in the research that I did emerged as one of the healing factors for the dreamers. This conference, this photo here is a um, conference that I was invited to right after the birthday party that you saw, the mariachis. Maybe I haven't shown that yet. Um, where I was welcomed as an honored guest. The, her son, Doña Hera's son, takes care of the site that you see, which is around the sacred mountain. He, he, he keeps people from stealing um, 
archaeological elements. They're starting to, to, the government is starting to do digs there. So he invited me to this conference. They're trying to keep um, Monsanto out of the region, which is not an easy task. So this mandala that you see is made of sacred corn. They brought, they did seed sharing at the end. So I'm invited to go, hey, Rebecca, do you want to come to this conference? And I say, yes. This is the same day of mom's death, one year anniversary. Aquí es nuestra visitante del norte. They introduce me, like waving, I'm the only foreigner there. Am I witnessing? What am I doing there? Am I telling? Am I reporting? I know that I feel myself to be transformed with each encounter. And I give back by being me. I give back with myself, with my presence. As soon as this drumming begins, I feel that I'm home. That's another question, where is home? In preparing for this, I reread The Dream in the Underworld by James Hellman. It's a key work for me. And one of the things that Hellman said is the psyche needs to be fed. This was in a bakery in Mexico City, preparing for Dia de Muertos. You know, it's a little bit, I was there a little bit early. The, the, the celebration hadn't really started yet. But here, this so ancient, so so pre-European, this chocolate and the sugar and these skulls. And so Dia de Muertos is not Halloween. And yet. This photo is my ofrenda for my mom. That's my mom and her sister when they were kids. This is a viejita danzante. I've rarely seen a female figure that's those dancers that act like old people. My mom loved those. So when we're creating this altar, if you want to create an ofrenda for a beloved based in this Dia de Muertos tradition, one of the things is to put their favorite things, their favorite foods, photos, Is it cultural misappropriation? It's if they're not selling it, I don't think so. It's tricky. I do have a link at the end of the slideshow about the history of Day of the Dead, and it is different from Halloween. Yet I still feel this connection. I also want you to notice there at the feet of the, the woman dancer figure, somebody here, I got that in Potsquaro, Jane, you'll recognize that, is a little rubber ducky my mom loved rubber duckies but this one has a spider on its head so my mom might come to haunt me because she hated spiders <laughs> but I couldn't resist so there's a little bit of um traviesa in that for me I can remember the year my comadre who's the mother of my goddaughter told me don't forget to put the water there the the souls will be thirsty when they come back this is a literal invitation, a literal invocation. It's not, the water isn't a metaphor, it's really true. Hillman goes on in The Dream in the Underworld that the alchemists had an operation called cybation, which is feeding, and another one called Im imbibition, soaking or steeping in which the psychic stuff that one was working on required the right food and drink at a certain moment during the opus of soul-making. And despite the care to be taken of not mixing up Dia de Muertos and Samhain or Greek um, uh, practices, of honoring the dead. They have these big feasts. There's still set for me, there's that Jungian idea of the collective and that this, this idea of honoring the dead with food is such a worldwide practice and, so, and through time also. 
see my marigolds that I got. The marigolds are important in Mexico because the dead are attracted to the smell and they find their way to the altar, to the ofrenda, by way of the smell of the marigolds. This was also true in Greece. They believed that the dead found their way back to the feast through the smells of the food that was prepared for them. So now we really approach the topic of death. In Mexico, images of dead are everywhere, images of skeletons, especially at this time of year. And the question that I asked before, what is it to dream of someone who has died? Is this my mother? In, in embodied imagination, we learn to not take the dream figures literally. That is, we don't tie them too much to waking life. The, associ the associations will always be there. It, yet, it is such a relief to have these dreams of my mom. It was such a solace and such a consolation. It was so beautiful to experience the laughter with her, to wake up to the memory of us laughing together. Sometimes we were younger. And yet the question still is, who is this dream mother? Is it my real mother come to visit? Or an imaginal dream guest who laughs in Mexico, is gifted a baby goat, who walks with ease, experiencing the pleasures of the world. There's a doubleness in embodied imagination. So it doesn't have to that I have to choose, oh, it's not my real mother, oh, it's my dream mother, it's also both. They both are there. So during this time in Mexico, I was there purposely, in addition to planning to be there for Doña Jera's birthday, I wanted to be there for the day of St. Michael Archangel, which is the patron saint of San Miguel de Allende, <laughs> San Miguel. And I found this other doubleness with um, Hillman's work that the images in Hades are Dionysian, he wrote, not fertile in the natural sense, but in the psychic sense, they are imaginatively fertile. There is an imagination below the earth that. There's this, in my experience in San Miguel at this time of year, is that there really are archangels flying around town. Patricia, you probably can attest to this. These mohigangas that people make there are these huge puppets with people dancing inside them. The procession that came <laughs> were about I counted well over uh, about a hundred dance groups from all over the country who came to dance. And it was about two miles. I looked it up. How long is it that they danced from the train station up to the main cathedral, the parroquia? And they dance and dance and dance. It's this faith that triumph over death. So death is acknowledged and is also a triumph at the same time. Now, let's see if I can get my screen to advance. I apologize, my friends. Here we go. The psychic processes of are continuously and creatively imagining and image making. You know, the subtitle of this presentation is about imagination. And what I find in Mexico is this is deepest imagination with the creative arts. And what I've noticed now, it had been five years since I'd been back, since I moved away. And I know the pandemic came upon all of us during this time. But what I noticed is for, for one, the amount of dance groups, it was incredible how many there were. As I was with my comadre, who I mentioned earlier, and my goddaughter flew in to visit me. And the amount their costumes it's like they must have been working on their 
outfits during the whole pandemic when the you know everything was shut down the amount of creativity in this people is so just um just astounding just amazingly the work with the hands the way everything's stitched And this is what I've also found in Hillman's work. And as a result of my research that the soul's realm, what we call the soul in archetypal psychology is the psychological ground of the imaginal, this mundus imaginalis is the title of my dissertation is engaging the soul of the world through dream. It's the place of encounter for interactions with dreams. And I feel like being in that, it was an hours long procession, watching them come up this hill and here's the incense. We were parked on a sidewalk in front of this church. So all the groups stopped in front of the church, bowed down, did their crosses and waved their copal incense in front of the church and then continued on. That was at Posada de Monjas. This is a living practice of the soul. I felt like I was in a dream state during that entire time. So to return a bit to the more analytical side of this work, the dream work is a complex living system. So when we go back into the dream and do that animation that happened with the little figures, like the ones, the little um, ceramic figures in the dream, and they become animated when they were noticed, the dream is a complex living system that continues to live on. And when we go back into it with embodied imagination, new forms continue to emerge out of the dream, like seeds of new life. Imagination offers a continuation of itself in new forms, sprouting out of the ground of experience, sprouting out of the dance. I have been amazed by the number of children dancing in this beautiful procession and this mother holding her baby who's also dressed like an Apache dancer. This is the Chichimeca group there, the Otomi, which they have a different name, which I apologize, I can't remember. <laughs> They're teaching their children this new, this this old form of dancing. It's being passed on. It's really a living form. So I want to thank you for being here. I want to honor my mom and her memory. She visited me so many times in Mexico while I was living there. Some of you met my mom in Mexico. When my brothers and I went to her grave in Colorado this summer, a red-tailed hawk appeared in a tree. And then a deer appeared as we were bringing flowers to her new headstone. There she is. These are her parents, my grandparents. I don't know what they're doing. They're on a raft. It's like such a cool photo. And this is a photo of my mom and my comadre, who I mentioned before, Kata, and my goddaughter, Lorena, who I think was seven years old back in Mexico. And having just been able to visit them in Mexico, Lorena's now 33, and she's got a college degree, and she's working. And I just thank all of my friends. I thank my ancestors. I thank Mexico. Here's a little slide of resources and references. So you can always go back in later and pick up the link for the um, Day of the Dead information. And then this is the link to my dissertation, which should be free. 
feel free to email me if you have any questions. This is my blog spot. I am on Facebook. My Facebook is Windows to the Soul. And I'll be launching my new webpage in 2024 and starting, hopefully, to teach in person again in Santa Fe. So please email me, look me up. And I think at this point, we can take some questions in the chat and continue to record for a few more minutes. And then we'll take the recording off and just chat without being recorded. So if anybody wants to drop a few questions into the chat. I'll go ahead and stop screen sharing. I can figure out how to do that. Oops. I'm trying to get my Zoom bigger. My thumbnail video. There we go. A size window. I can't. I'm trying to get to see the chat, and I'm trying to get to see somehow my screen got small so i can't see you all thank you all so much for being here i just love seeing your beautiful faces here hi friends thank you let's see and i still can't see i'm trying to get into the uh into my bigger screen so maybe Evie, are there any questions in there that look interesting? I can't, I can't quite get to, uh, to see the chat right now. Something funny happened to me. My... Yeah, there is a question. Have you ever felt like a dream of a deceased loved one is an actual visitation? Uh, is an actual invitation? Visitation. Have you ever felt like a dream of a deceased loved one is an actual visitation? This question is such a good question. Um, and I think it really informs the work of embodied imagination is to not take things literally. So it's kind of going back to that question of, is it, a liter the literal person coming back or is it the dream figure coming back? And I would, from my work and my experience, I like to hold that it's both and that it isn't, sometimes it feels that way so strongly from people who have a dream of a loved one that for them, there's no sort of denying that, that it is the dream person. It is the person coming back. Um, one of the things that in embodied imagination, the idea is that the dream, there's nothing behind the dream. It's not, it's a, it's its own world. So that the dream world is its own world. And it's different from our waking world. And that I think is almost more of a spiritual question. One of the things that um, my teacher, Robbie Bosnack, says is that dreams are, this is from his book, Embodied Imagination, dreams are unknown lands with laws of their own. Dreams are unknown lands with laws of their own. And I think that is probably my answer to that question, is that I don't know. And if it's that uh, true for a person who's experiencing that, then that's definitely true for them. So I would never like stop that or say, oh no, that's not true. But to always leave that sense of mystery, I think is really important in this work that there's so much we don't know about dreams and about the world. And that's how I like to leave that question. Rebecca, there is another question. What would be a basic comprehensive text for a beginner to read? Yes, I think, as I put at the end of the um, resources, 
the embodied imagination book, which is right here, is really um, helpful. It's it has a lot of examples of the dream work. Um, it's creative imagination in medicine, art, and travel by Robbie Bosnak. There are also examples here of how dream work, how the work of embodied imagination can apply to creative practices. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to apply to dreams. We can also work with memories using that. Another book of his, and of course, this is Dream in the Underworld, James Hillman, um, which is quite dense. You know, it's very Hillman, but it was a basic text for me in my dissertation work. And this is an older book of Robbie's. It's called A Little Course in Dreams. And his, I've been following his work for many years. This is like from the 80s. Um, this, his work has transformed a lot from that initial work, but has lots of really great tips in here about how to remember a dream, how to go back into a dream. Um, and now my voice is going out again. One of the things I've noticed as I age is the dream memory doesn't stick as much. The dreams are more evaporative and um, that's kind of normal. So you don't have to get too worried about that if that's happening to you. Um, but also, there's a way of working with memory in an embodied way that helps the memory come alive. So we don't have to necessarily remember dreams to be able to do embodied imagination. And then you can look at my dissertation too, because my even though it's very academic and a lot of the tone that when, where I describe the process of the work with the dreamers, it's very, um, it was the the dreamers i just want to honor the dreamers that participated in my research they were so wonderful and the description of how they immediately delved were able to delve into the to the embodied imagination practice was just um stunning and so reading that was it's very poetic certain parts of it there's a long term goal i hate to say it out loud but of like turning your dissertation into a book that's more geared toward um a, a wider audience. That's a long-term project that I have in the back of my mind always. 